I want to talk to you this morning a few minutes about this thought, the image, the image of God in you, the image of God in you. Now, every one of us here today, we have an image of ourself. Whether we realize it or not, whether we've ever thought about it or not, every one of us have an image of ourselves. And the word says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You see, we think in pictures. Amen? We think in pictures. Uh, if, I say, if I say banana, what did you see? You didn't see an apple. Amen? So we communicate and uh, we think in terms of pictures. Okay? I always like to give a definition. The word image is a visible representation of the imitation of a form of a person or a thing. It means a copy or a shadow. And I'm going to read, if you want to read along with me, in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start way back and look at, uh, look at the, the image that God has of us. And look at the image that we have of us. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. Everybody say image. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and all over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, male and female created them. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the, of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, not air. Mm -hmm. But see, now he formed a man. He formed him out of the ground, out of the dirt. You came from this earth. You came from dirt. <laughs> and God took that earth, he took that dirt, and he uh, formed it. And then after he formed it, but even though it's formed, it has no life. Amen. It's just a form. A form is something that you build to put something into. This concrete floor was not here until it was, there was a form. And after the form was in place, then the concrete could be poured in. And the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed his nostrils in him, and the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Get the picture now. It's just a form. It has no life. It has no spirit. It's just a form until God breathed himself. God breathed himself, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So what God did is when he breathed himself into Adam, he breathed the very image of himself. He would have to. He breathed into Adam the very image of himself. And so uh, when we talk about his image, we're not talking about physically, and we'll look at this in just a few minutes. It might include physical, but that's not, that's not uh, the, the physical part was just a form. Hello? It was the spirit part that made him a living soul. And so uh, when God looked at Adam and when Adam looked at himself, he saw God. See, if you look in the mirror, you don't see you. You see a reflection. You see an image. Amen? But you don't see you. All right, so God created Adam in such a way that when God looked at Adam, he saw himself. 
when he looked into the mirror, he saw himself. That is God's plan. We are to be a reflect, reflection of God. Are you listening to me now? But we cannot be a reflection of God if we're looking in the mirror and seeing ourselves. Mm -hmm. But now what happened was is Adam sinned. And his inner image changed from an image of God, from, from a reflection of God, to an image of sin. See, his, what happened was his image changed. How he saw himself changed because he, when, when the image changed, then he's afraid of God. Mm -hmm. And he runs and he hides from God. And so Adam, when he was uh, uh, created in the earth, he was created in the image of God, in the image of him. Now, in Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto our fathers by the prophets, and in these last days he spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom all, say, all things the worlds exist, who being, watch this now, he's talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, not the express image of his physical body, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high so notice that god or jesus was the very image of god the first adam lost the image of god the last adam the lord jesus christ brought it back to us that was the first time that was the first time since Adam that anybody with an image of God lived in this earth. Okay? Now, I want to read from, uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is, as he does many times, he is comparing the law and the righteousness that came under the law, which was a self-righteousness. He's comparing that to the righteousness of Christ. And notice he said that when, I, when Moses went up on the mountain, that he had to put a veil, when he came back down, he had to put a veil over his face. Why? Because of the glory of God. Now the veil that he put over his face represented spiritual death because the people were still spiritually dead and they cannot look at him because of the glory. And as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished, talking about the law. The law was abolished in, in the Lord Jesus. 14th verse, but their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil, that is, spiritual death, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. He's talking about the Jews here. Mm -hmm. which, fail, which veil is taken away in Christ, that is, spiritual death is taken away. The condemnation that came with the law is taken away. See, the law only ministered from the outward man, and no man could live right before God. He had a law, but he couldn't keep the law. Yes, Amen. Because his heart wasn't right. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Here again, talking about the Jew's heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. When the heart of the Jew is turned to the Lord, then the veil of spiritual death is taken away. Now, now the Lord is that spirit. Now see, when you were born again, you received the very Spirit of God. I'm not talking about Holy Ghost. This is not Holy Ghost. This is the new nature. This is the image of God that you received, just like the first Adam 
When God breathed his life into him, he received the image of God on the inside of him. Well, the same thing is true here. When you and I are born again, we receive the image of God on the inside of us, the very spirit of God. This is not talking again about Holy Ghost. He's talking about our born again spirit. And he says, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He's talking about being free from the law because we are now um, living in the spirit, born again. But the 18th verse, but we all with open face, that is not, uh, not, not spiritually dead, not veiled, but we, we all with open face beholding as in a glass, a mirror. What do we see when we look in the mirror? As in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord, then we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, we are changed. We are, uh, we are transformed, okay, by the new nature that is within us. Are we doing all right yet? In Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of of his son. The image of his son was the image of God. The image of his son was the image of Adam before he fell. He said, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Here's, here's the point. The point number one is that when you were born again, you received an image. You received the image of God on the inside of your spirit, not in your head, not in your body, but in your spirit. So for us to be and do everything that God wants us to be, guess what? God has to change our image of ourself. We have got to see ourself as God sees us. We have to see ourselves as the very image of God. What God wants us to do is to be able to look in the mirror and see him. Amen. Now, God has to change us. He has to change our thinking. He's got to change that image that we have on the inside of us. And I got three examples of that right here. There was Gideon. Judges 6, 11, and 12. Mm -hmm. And there came an angel of the Lord. Now, you understand what's going on here. The Midianites are coming down and, and, and stealing the, 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 the crops. They are uh, fighting against Israel. They are stealing everything. They cannot have a decent life because the Midianites kept coming down and stealing everything that they need, everything that, that, that they had to live a good life life and to fulfill God's purpose. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Oprah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abazarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress, watch this, to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, watch this, watch this. Now we've got Gideon, he's scared, he's hiding. He's hiding so that the Midianites won't come down and steal the wheat that he's threshing. Can you see that? But then the Lord comes to him through an angel, and he said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. <laughs> well, in the natural, hello, what God was showing him was the image that he had of him. You mighty man of valor. That's the way God sees us. God had a purpose and God had a plan for Gideon, but he could not fulfill that plan or that purpose in the shape he was in because he had the wrong image of himself. He was seeing himself the wrong way. Now, another example was Abraham. In Genesis 15, 1 through 6, 
After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Talking about Eleazar. This shall not be thine heir, God said, but he shall come forth out of thine own bowels. Shall he be thine heir? Now you got to understand, Abraham's 100 years old. Sarah, I think, is around 90 years old. And he brought him forth abroad. That is so important. You know, sometimes God's got to get us out of our environment. Mm-hmm in order to reveal something to us. You're not going to get where you're going hanging out with the wrong people. And he brought him forth abroad. Well, he had to get him out of the tent. He had to get him out of the kind of thinking because what did he just say? He said, I don't have a child. You promised me a child, but I don't have a child. Because, see, God had told him he would be the father of many nations. Well, we all are the children of Abraham through Christ. So it wasn't just talking about the Jew. It was talking about the church as well. Look now toward heaven. So he brings him out. And he said, now look toward heaven and tell, tell the stars if thou are able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it for righteousness. So see, he had to begin to see himself as a father. As a matter of fact, he, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham, and Abraham means father of a multitude. So what's God doing? God is changing the image. He is trying to get Abraham to see what he's seeing. In order for God to do what he wants to do in your life, you have to see yourself as God sees you. Amen. Another example is Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, 5 through 11. He said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Now you see the image he had? See? God's, God's called him. He said, you're a prophet. He says, not me because I can't speak. I'm just a child. And what did God say? Say not. Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all I will send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto him, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And then he says, See? See? See, God had to change his image first before he could see anything else. Before he could see the, hand, the, the, the work and the plan of God, he had to change what, how the way he saw himself. And before we can fulfill everything that God has for us, mm -hmm. then we have to see ourselves. Yes, Amen. And have the image. See, he said, I have set thee over nations and over kingdoms. He had to see himself this way. He had to have a different image. He said to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? What seest thou? Because whatever he sees is going to determine how well he fulfills the plan of God. Yes, now, the image that you have of yourself, you can't change it by just rebuking it. You cannot change that image by getting in a prayer line. You can't change that image. You can't change the way you see yourself. Mm -hmm. 
by just praying or having somebody else to pray for you. The only way you can change an image of yourself is it has to be replaced with another image. Well, how are you going to get another image? I'm glad you asked. The way you're going to change the image is you're going to have to meditate God's Word. Feed on God's Word. You've got to find out what God says about you. And that's why we're talking about it this morning. We're trying to get you, God's trying to get us to see ourselves as He sees us. And the only way we can do that is through meditation. And also we read it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that we, we have to see ourselves in Christ. We have to be able to look in a mirror, like you said, and see the image of Christ. Amen? Amen? Now, there are certain images that have to be replaced. For instance, if you have an env uh, uh, image of yourself as insignificant, in other words, if you see yourself as having no value, I'm not important. The next thing is, if you have an image of yourself as a baby, because babies, that's what Jeremiah saw. He saw himself as a baby. And babies, I mean, all a baby does, you have to minister to the baby. The baby doesn't minister anything. Isn't that right? It has to have somebody taking care of it, watching over it, protecting it. And as long as you have that baby mentality, you're always going to be depending on somebody else. The next image that we have a lot of times is we see ourselves as a sinner. And the reason we do is because we were all sinners. And in, even after we've been born again, guess what? See, you, you're going to miss it. You're going to fail. You're going to sin. Just because you sin doesn't make you a sinner. Hello? You are still the righteousness of God in Christ. That's why we have to confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we cannot see ourselves as an old sinner saved by grace. We have to see ourselves in Christ Jesus that we are the very righteousness of God, meaning that we've been justified. No matter what our flesh says, no matter what somebody else says, amen, no, no matter what our failures say. Another thing that will that'll have to be dealt with is your past mistakes and failures. There's a minister by the name of uh, Andrew Warmack. Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, he's awesome. He's awesome. Yeah, he's awesome, man. But he told this. He said that when he was in high school, he played on the football team. And his position was he was the center that hiked the ball to the punter. The, you know, he, he was the long snapper. And when he would snap the ball for them to kick or to uh, punt or to uh, have a uh, uh, field goal or extra point, that was his responsibility. And he said, usually in any situation, when you snap the ball to the guy, it was about 15 yards. Well, what happened was they were backed up on their own goal line. And so the punter was standing at the back of the, uh, the goal line. Or not the goal line, but the end zone. And so it was only 11 yards. So it's a whole different scenario. So when he snapped the ball, it was a little, it was high. But the punter could have called it, but the punter's not used to it being there. And so... It went through his hands, and guess what? This was a state playoff. It went through his hands, went above his head, and they lost the game because the uh, safety gave the other team two points. They lost the state playoff by two points. 
And he said that he was hated by 2,500 students. Now, you know, that could have that could have uh, been an image that he lived with the rest of his life. It could have been an image that destroyed his life. We can't let one failure, one mistake define us and change the image that's on the inside of us. We have got to continually look at what God has done in us. And then another thing we do sometimes and we get in trouble with this, and I know I've done it, and most of us have, especially if you're in the ministry, is that is comparing yourself with others. Right. You know, I can stand here and I could look at uh, people that that, that that are the same age I am. They started in the ministry the same time I did, and yet they've got hundreds of people or they've got thousands of people. But you know what? I can't look at that. Because they're not in my shoes. They're not where God sent me. They're not, I'm telling you, I'm te- I, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say this. But, you know, uh, I guess we all have our insecurities, but, uh, you know, I still have to deal with mine just like you have to deal with yours. And the devil tries to beat me up with the idea that, well, my congregation is not any bigger than it is. Hello? Amen. And so I look at myself and I say, well, you know, I'm a, I must not be a very good preacher or teacher. And yet, I, just th- thumbing through or clicking through the, 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 the Christian channels, mm-hmm. some of them are awesome. Some of them are awesome. Mm-hmm. I could name a few that I really enjoy once in but then I watched some, sometimes, more than one, got this huge congregation. And I'm sitting there looking at them. And they couldn't preach their way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> so what am I doing? I'm comparing myself to them and I'm saying, my God, I can do better than that. How did you get thousands and thousands of people in, in, in your church? And you can't preach any better than this. I'm missing something somewhere. But see, God put me here. God put a ministry in me. I'm not like anybody else on this planet, and you're not either. You have your own fingerprints. You have your own DNA. You have your own gifting. Hello. You came from this, uh, a different family. You came from a different environment. Some people have more to overcome than others. I'm just telling you. Amen. I'm thinking of a, a particular ministry, and he's about my age, but he's doing an awesome work. He's an awesome teacher. But then I hear his testimony, and I hear how his mom and dad, uh, how they raised him. And he, had a, he came in a, a great Christian family. And not only that, but when he was old enough, he started doing this, uh, uh, not karate, but uh, some of the martial arts. He was in that several years. And you have to be disciplined to do that. So you're telling me he didn't have an advantage? Why would the word say, you know, train up a child in the way he'll go? And he won't depart from it. Hello? He and I didn't come from the same place. As a matter of fact, when we all stand before Jesus, it's not going to be based on how many souls we got saved. It's all going to be, like I said last week, according to the book it's already written on us. It's how we stewarded what God gave us. And every one of us are different. So, We've got to change that image of comparing ourselves with anybody else. Amen? And yet it's so easy to do. Uh, Another thought is you're not smart enough. Well, you're not smart enough. Uh, Someone said everybody's ignorant just on different subjects. Amen? I mean, you can be a doctor and still be a fool. I've known some of them. 
I've dealt with a lot of doctors in the last few years. You can be a lawyer. I mean, you, you, you have great knowledge. You can go to court and win every case and still be a fool. And yet you can be a minister or a Christian and you can be uneducated. And yet God can use you supernaturally a lot of times because you know you're not smart enough. So you have to depend on his wisdom. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I'm not smart enough. I've never been the best at anything. And uh, you probably haven't either. So I'm not smart enough. you got to change that. God knew you before he called you. Before He knew you. He predestined you before you got here. And he gave you everything you needed to fulfill his purpose and destiny. Amen. I was thinking just now, I was thinking about, well, you know, my son is uh, in the trucking business, my oldest son, uh, 20, 20 trucks, uh, just huge, huge business, making great money. Uh, and, and I know he never got past the eighth grade. As a matter of fact, I, it dawned on me one day. I haven't seen a I haven't seen a report card in a while. <laughs> so I went to the school, and sure enough, I found his re report card. But he'd been signing it himself, <laughs> and he was failing everything. I said something one day about a book. He said, "I never read a book in my life." You know, you can you can go through life and fulfill your purpose and never be able how to know how to dissect a frog. I had to take algebra in school. I never have used algebra. I thought it was, thought it was stupid to me. <laughs> Turn, turning numbers into letters. You gotta be kidding me. I never had to use trigonometry. I, I'm not smart, but I can tell you this, I'm cast out a devil. Hey, come on. Hey, come on. Amen. And then, and then you get this mindset that I don't have enough faith. Well, yeah, you do. By grace, were you saved through faith? Everyone's been given a measure of faith. Well, what was that measure? Well, it's whatever you needed to fulfill your purpose and destiny. Here on this earth. Yes, Amen. Amen. Which includes, you know, you have to prosper, you have to grow, you have to mature. Amen. You have to walk in health to fulfill. So faith, you, you receive the, the measure of faith. You got, I don't know how much you receive, and I don't know how much I receive, but that faith has to be developed. But everybody, you have enough faith. It just needs to be used. Amen. It just needs to be developed. It needs to grow. And that's why we're talking about faith. Faith is foundational to your walk with the Lord. And then another thing is that uh, I'm just not good enough. I'm, I'm just not good enough. Uh, I just didn't pray much this week. I didn't, I didn't read the Bible enough. Matter of fact, I, I lost my temper. Hello out there. Uh, I thought what I, I thought things I shouldn't have been thinking. I felt things toward people I shouldn't have felt. So I'm not good enough. Most every person in the Bible that God used failed at some point. Abraham lied. Said Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. Uh, Samson, he was, uh, he had a lust problem, cost him his strength. Hello? And God used him. What about David? Whoa. Amen. Committed adultery and also murder. And it's still called Jesus, son of the son of David. Mm-hmm. You probably hadn't, you probably hadn't messed up bad as they did. 
but God used them anyway. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking the, this week, let me give you another take on somebody like Jimmy Swaggart. Most of what we said and most of what other preachers have said is they always talk about his sin. They always talk about uh, where he missed it and his failure. And he had, see, you never walked in his shoes. And Mama used to t tell me, you know, you don't ever judge a man until you walk in his shoes. And so anyway, he had a problem. He had it his whole life. And yet God blessed him and used him anyway. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the only thing that changed when he was, he, he was caught was what man, how man saw him. How did God see him? He saw him in his spirit. He saw him as an image of himself. Now, what I was about to say is this. You know, if I've been caught in a situation like this, he lost everything. They kicked him out of his denomination. He became the laughing stock. He became, uh, 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 and I'm telling you that preachers rejoiced and were excited about that uh, because they were saying, I've heard him say, well, I don't even do that, you know. And yet he's ministering to the thousands, and I'm ministering to this little group here. But I see things different now. What all that is about is religion. The Bible says, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest yourself be tempted. Now, no, you don't justify what they did. Absolutely, you don't. But then, you know, uh, I have to say this, and, and, and the, the, uh, the, the adultery was not the only thing. It had to do with his attitude towards some brethren and so forth and so on. But the thing is, is he didn't quit. Right. And now he's got a huge ministry again. Maybe not to the place that it was before. But he could have quit. Andrew Womack could have quit. I saw this one time. I saw a uh, World Series game. There was this relief pitcher. He, he pitched, and, and, the, and, and the guy hit it out of the park, and the, they lost the game, lost the World Series. He walked right off the mound. And right into the, the clubhouse. Somebody asked him about it, and he said, that's in the past. I knew another guy who did the same thing, and he wound up committing suicide. Why? Because the image that he had. Guys, listen to me. We've got to start seeing ourselves as the image of God. That's what God wants of us. God wants to look at us and see himself. And that image is in our born-again spirit. But that image has to be manifested through our soul and our body. That's why we have to, even though the image is on the inside of here, and so we have to look at that what Christ has done in here. That's what we do. We meditate the Word, and we meditate on who we are in Christ. That's what you have to do to change that image. Because if we were already perfected in our image, then we would have already arrived. There would be nowhere to go. But God created Adam in his own image. He created Jesus in his own image. And Jesus created us in his own image. Jesus walked in the fullness of the image of God in him. God wants us to do the same thing. Okay, so how do you see yourself this morning? What kind of image do you have of yourself? Because you got one. You might not think about it. 
Mm -hmm. But you have an image of yourself. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Amen. And we think in pictures. So how do we see ourselves? Listen, what do we see ourselves doing? God gave us an imagination. What do we see? Not just the image of God in us, how we see ourselves, but what do we see ourselves doing? I taught a couple of weeks ago on the power of imagination. Why don't you go ahead and stand?